Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. The long history of the Lexington Public Library started in the early 1900s, and since then, it has experienced many changes, expansions, and growth. As Fayette County and the city of Lexington merged, the population growth necessitated the library's expansion of service in order to reach the citizens' information needs. As we embark on the building of a new branch on Versailles Road, it got me thinking about how far this library system has come from its original building at the Carnegie Library in Gratz Park. Here with us today is my colleague, Wayne Johnson, the Lexington Public Library's resident historian and researcher extraordinaire to talk to us about the various library buildings and the story of how they came to be. Welcome, Wayne. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Marion. Yeah, we always love having Wayne oh, yeah, on the I, podcast. <laughs> I, I've all, I enjoy doing these podcasts. Uh, yeah. I'm going to begin by talking about how we came up with the idea for this podcast on uh, LPL, sure. Building History. The title is Building Dreams, A History of LPL Buildings. Nice. Uh, back in the winter, our programming staff got together for an all-day meeting to talk about planning for programs. And it, this this meeting included a review of our summer reading program themes that we're going to do week by week. The themes for the summer reading are read, explore, write, solve, build, and draw. Now, the goal for the summer reading program is to create programs around these themes. Well, the one theme that caught my attention immediately, given my interest in LPL history, along with the fact that LPL, as you mentioned, is preparing for a new branch, the village branch, I decided to plan my programming around the build theme. We have displays set up here in the Kentucky Room in the month of July. We're holding a scavenger hunt for the kids here in the Kentucky Room this week, July 11th through the 15th. And later on in the podcast, Miriam, you mentioned the Village Branch. You'll be giving us an update on the temporary housing. And uh, Miriam is now the assistant manager over at Village, so she knows quite a bit about Well, yeah, as much as I can divulge. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, well, there's no not, mystery about this at all. They're not <laughs> divulging to me because I don't know anything that's happening other than we moved over to Alexandria Drive. Mm-hmm. Now, since we're talking about summer reading and building history, some of the programs we had this summer, I just really get a kick out of watching the parents bring in the kids and they do these programs. The library was formed in January 1795 when some prominent citizens met, collected some money, by selling subscription shares and collected about $500. The money was sent to Philadelphia and some 300 plus books were delivered the next year. The route of delivery of these books was over the Allegheny Mountains, then they were placed on flat boats and sent down the Ohio River to Maysville and then overland over the Maysville Road to Lexington. Now, the book collection was housed at the Transylvania Seminary in Grants Park, and it was called, for the first couple years, it was called the Transylvania Library. Collection was used by the seminary students and the library subscribers. It was a subscription library. Yeah, so people actually paid a fee to to use it. You actually had to pay to get the books. You had to be a subscriber. And for the first hundred years or so, that's what the library was. It was a subscription library. As most libraries... Many libraries were in the United States during the 19th century. Now, by an act of the Kentucky legislature on November 29, 1800, the library was incorporated under the name the Lexington Library. Previous one is over at the uh, Transylvania Seminary for the first couple of years. It was called the Transylvania Library. Now, until 1866, the housing of the book collection was unstable to say the least. We were constantly moving from location to location in the downtown area. Then it moved to a apothecary shop, McCullough's uh, shop, on the northeast corner of Short and Market Street. And it stayed there for uh, four or five years. Then it moved to the Public Square, which is around the uh, Cheapside Park, Tandy Park area. It was located at the northwest corner of the Public Square. And then it moved to Garen's Confectionery Shop on Mill Street between... Main and short. Interesting story about 
this particular shop was part of it is still in existence. Oh, okay. And years ago when we were researching our library history for our staff development day in I think 2007, my wife used to like to go down to the dances at the arts dance mm -hmm. thing on Friday nights. Okay. And, of course, I had to go, too. Of course. So, so one <laughs> night during the intermission, I just told her, hey, I'm going to walk down to this, this shop on Mill Street and just check it out. And I walked in, and the, the person running the bar or whatever it is, I just told him, I think he thought I may, may have been a policeman or something. Because <laughs> he kept looking up on the, uh, there was noise being made up on the second floor, and he kept looking up there like, uh, you better not go up there. <laughs> but I just explained to him I was researching library history and that a portion of his building used to be where the library collection was held. You were asking too many questions. I was, <laughs> and uh, I didn't dare go up to the second floor. So anyway, it was it was in that confectionery shop between 1819 and 1825. Later on, it moved over to the old insurance building on the north side of uh, Main Street between Upper and Limestone Street. Now in 1841, uh, due to financial problems and so forth, the library was closed. Then it opened back up in 1846, and a building was found over on, at the northwest corner of Market and Church. It was the old Transylvania Medical College building, and the collection was housed there. Then there was a fire in 1854, so they had to move again they, to a downtown room, which was on Mill Street between Main and Short. And then uh, in 1855... Through 1866, we again moved our collection over to a building on North Upper across from the old courthouse. It was called Jordan's Row. That whole block was called Jordan's Row. And it wasn't really until 1866 that we got what you would consider a, a permanent long-term building. We moved into the old Methodist Church building, northwest corner of Market and Church. And we stayed there until we moved to the Carnegie at library in 1905. Now, the thing to keep in mind of all these buildings is these weren't library construction No, buildings. they were just, they just temporary. Yeah. yeah, temporary mm -hmm. holdings for our collection. And it wasn't until, and as I mentioned earlier, we were a subscription library. Yeah, yeah. Which left a lot of people out. Of course, of course. But in 1898, as we're closing out the 19th century and getting ready to enter the 20th century, big changes were happening at the Lexington Library. It was in 1898 that a legislative act allowed second-class cities, of which Lexington was one, to form a free public library so we could get away from the subscription library and be a free public library open to all. And also serve more people. that Free to all. Now, a lease agreement between the Lexington Library Company, which... The subs was a subscription library, and the new free public library transferred the library building over there on Market and Church, their entire book collection, equipment, etc. They transferred all this property over to the free public library. There was an agreement that for a five-year period, this would be the case, and at the end of the five years, if the free public library proved to be a success, all the property equipment books would be turned over to the free public library. Mary Bullitt, a former newspaper society reporter, was named a librarian. So she was the first official librarian of the free public library. Now, on April 10th, 1899, after a lot of, Mary, you'll, you'll get, you'll understand this, after a lot of moves and getting things ready, the Lexington Public Library opened as a free public library. They didn't have to transfer the collection because the collection was over already over at the building, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Like I mentioned, it, it was still located at the, at the old Methodist Church. At the time, funding was 3% of the school tax and one half of the police fines. And there's an old story that library officials used to root for lawbreakers <laughs> to get caught because it would meant be more, more money for the library. Oh. Yeah. So during Prohibition, they probably <laughs> said, drink up, you know, get caught. You will help the library. Okay. As we enter th this new century, the 20th century, we leave behind a century of a subscription library and begin our history as a free public library. And at this point, like I mentioned, we're still at the Market Street location. But in 1901, December of 1901, in probably the, in probably the most important letter ever written in LPL history, 
at least in my research, there could have been more, but given our history, this was a very important letter. Library board chairman at the time, Charles Bronston, wrote to steel magnate Andrew Carnegie asking him for money to build a new library building. Carnegie was, at the time, was using his fortune to give to various communities to build public libraries. The first library he donated to was in his hometown of uh, Scotland. So Carnegie was very generous with his money, and Charles Bronston was aware of this and wrote to him, and uh, after a few back-and-forth letters, Carnegie said yes and ended up donating $60,000 to Lexington for a new library. One of the stipulations of Car Carnegie's uh, donation was that not only did the city have to provide a site for the uh, library, but the city uh, must agree to support the library with an annual amount of funds each year. And so, of course, the city said, sure. So, and before we get over to the Carnegie building, I do want to mention this since uh, this is a children's summer reading theme topic. The library, when it was still over at the Market Street location, on May 18th, 1901, opened up a children's room. Oh. My research shows this is the first time that a room was dedicated to children. So the first children's room was uh, in 1901. And we mentioned the funding the city had to give for the support of the library. I think when we first started out, it was $5,000 annually. And the Fayette Physical Court, which, as we discussed during our merger podcast last year, which was basically the county government, agreed to give about $1,000 per year. And as is the case today, even back then, there's a certain process when we build a new building that the board and the architects and so forth go through. So at the time, the library took bids from six architects for this new building in Gratz Park, which turned out to be the Carnegie Library building. And a architect by the name of Herman, I pronounce it Rowe, R-O-W-E, some people say it's Rao. Herman Rowe is how I pronounce it. He was selected as the architect. Rowe had designed quite a few buildings over to UK campus, and he actually designed the uh, opera house. So anyway, Rowe got to designing the building and construction started. A cornerstone was buried in the northeast corner of the building foundation in Gratz Park on June 8, 1903. And it wasn't supposed to be open. This cornerstone zinc box, a.k.a. a time capsule, was buried. And it wasn't supposed to be open for 100 years. But when the library moved from Carnegie over here to Central in 1989, it was opened up. And well, we have all the material that was buried in the cornerstone zinc box. And we have it on display this month in the Kentucky. It's very interesting. You should yeah. everybody should come by and see it. Yeah. Yeah. The zinc box, they when they opened it up, got a lot of jagged e edges. So whenever I handle it, I make sure to handle it very carefully because it's uh, pretty sharp. Um, so anyway, on on in June of 1905, the Carnegie Library was open and would be the main library for the next 84 years. It was two stories and it had a basement. It was open to all, and everyone was allowed in the library, in the library building. But there was segregation in the building. Uh, there was a room dedicated just for use by the African-American community, and we can talk about more on that later. Now, with this new building, this is the first new building, new construction in LPL's history, and it was actually owned by the library kind of set the tone for future building construction and uh, moves, but it would be several decades before we would... Actually move. <laughs> yes. But at the time, you know, it met the needs of the, the community, and, and as with any other institution at the time, it was segregated, and there was a special service provided for African Americans. Yes. And as you have experienced in the last month or so with the move over to your temporary quarters for village... There's the logistics of moving the collection to a new building. Oh, yes. <laughs> that uh, is very... Time-consuming and takes a lot of effort and teamwork. And at the time when they moved from uh, the Market Street location to the new Carnegie uh, building, they fumigated the books. 
Oh. Uh, yeah, because it had been years and years and years. Now, Mary Bullitt did experiment a little bit after we moved into the Carnegie Building with uh, things called the library stations in outlying sections of the city where they would set up these library stations, and each station would have like a 100 fiction and nonfiction books that people wouldn't have to come down to Gratz Park to use the library. But because of finances and logistics and so forth, this this only lasted for a couple of years. So, but it was the beginning of satellite libraries and yes. be able to reach more of the community. Yes, they were even thinking back then that you got to reach out to where the users are. Exactly, outside of the physical physical building. Okay, now we're fast forwarding to uh, 1944. It was then that a ruling was put into place that public libraries like Lexington, second class cities, were to be funded by law at five cents per $100 property valuation. So that's a significant change. Yes, and mm-hmm. just, just keep that number in mind five cents per 100 because it, uh, it has dominated uh, discussion of funding. Yes to this very day and became a point of contention in the 60s and 70s. Now, this act in 1944 also provided or included a provision that a certified librarian be hired. It was a requirement that you had to be a certified librarian. Up to that point, people that served as librarians here, head librarians, didn't have to be certified. But this uh, 1944 law made it a requirement. And in 1946, Virginia Hayes was selected as the librarian. And we used to, growing up in Lexington, my aunt, uh, who used to take us to the library at times, um, actually was good friends with Virginia Hayes. Mm-hmm. So we always thought, you know, head librarian back in that, those days were, was like what the CEO is today. Yeah, the, the uh, director. Yeah, the director, the top person and we always thought it was a big kick we'd go in the library and we'd get to talk to miss hayes Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) know, just because she was uh friends and well anyway she she served as director for 20 years Mm -hmm. until i think she left 1967 or 1968 well anyway she instituted a lot of changes when she came on board one of them was our local history indexing was begun uh, with Charles Staples, mm-hmm. and she also created a Kentucky room. And then on September seventeenth, nineteen fifty one, the Bookmobile service began, which was a great service. There was various stops throughout the city that the Bookmobile would go to and deliver. Just open up the doors, and the kids and the families could go in there and select books. Uh, so the big Bookmobile service was a huge upgrade in accessing our collection to the community. Definitely, and I think it was instrumental in getting the books into the low-income areas, the predominantly African-American areas, so people would have access to the library that they weren't able to come physically to downtown, the town areas, you know, in the outlying Fayette County area. As I mentioned earlier about the segregated reading room, there's not a lot of mention of it in the board minutes, but things I did read, when Miss Hayes, Virginia Hayes, came on board as dr- the director, I got to feel that she did not feel the library was doing enough to reach out to the African-American community. Yeah, and historically, of course, it wasn't. Most libraries yeah. didn't, yeah. which is, uh, I, I feel personally, as a, a stain on the library's history that hopefully we try to redeem. But it's it's definitely something that, on, the, on a small scale, a lot of the librarians did not feel <laughs> we would never ever do enough for the African-American community. Yeah. She wanted to reach out to the African community mm-hmm. a little bit more. Yes. And on June 17, 1949, the Laurel Carroll branch was open on Georgetown Road for the neighborhood. And it was open primarily for the African-American yeah. community. Yeah, yeah. We had Miss Ruth Gaylord. She was a mentor of mine as, as a teenager when working start when I first started working at the library. She was the first African American librarian hired by by the library, and I think that took definitely po- some positive steps into opening the library to the African American community and other minorities. She started out as the librarian on the bookmobile, and she was instrumental in getting books 
into the hands of, of young black children and opened up the world to, to many. And the newspaper articles at the time, the mayor and library officials dedicated the building and, and the mayor, I think it was Mayor Mooney, made it a point to mention that minorities were still allowed to come down to the Carnegie building. And uh, it was at this time that the sign of the uh, segregated reading room was taken down. But again, reading the board minutes, I, I've read the board minutes from almost be the beginning, and it they really stay away from that topic. Of course, yeah, of course, because it was, you know, something that people didn't didn't talk about. And that's probably why it festered for so long when you don't talk about things. But, you know, you, you also look at the old historical pictures of, you know, and you do see African-Americans going using the entire library. There are actual pictures to prove that. I don't think the librarians really stuck to the segregated sign. When it was mentioned in the board minutes, it would be a quick one sentence blur. Yeah. Like, yeah. OK, we're going to open up the Laurel Carroll branch and, yeah. you know. That, that kind of thing. Now, the Laurel Carroll branch remained open for two years. Mm -hmm. And Laurel Carroll was a former educator, I think, at the Lincoln School. I know she was a former educator. And the reason the branch was named the Laurel Carroll branch is they had a uh, naming contest at a school. And a little girl by the name of Lucy Henderson suggested Laurel Carroll. So that's what the branch was named after in honor of Laurel Carroll. I think she died about 10 years before the branch opened up. Anyway, the Laurel Carroll branch remained open on Georgetown Road for about two years. But when the bill service began, they no longer saw, the library no longer saw a need for that branch. Bookmobile service could go out there yeah. and, and serve the community. So it closed down when the bookmobile service started. As I mentioned, the, the 1944 state law provided a pretty consistent funding for the library for the next 20 years with five five cents per $100. And um, during this time, there was some tension between the city government and the county government because although the percentage of usage of the library by the county people was increasing every year, you know, people were branching out and moving out to the county, and the fiscal court appropriations for the library did not increase. Mm -hmm. So there was some tension between the board and county officials about, hey, you got to give more money. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I think in, in 1962, at the end of 62 or beginning of 62, board kind of said, hey, if you don't start giving more money, <laughs> you can't use the library. <laughs> but they, they worked things out. The fiscal court ended up giving more money. But, uh, you know, talking about demographics, it's, it's the city was growing yes. year by year growing out. And the merger did not take place until 1974. So you still had your Fayette County government and your city government. The 20 years between 19, 21 years between 1944 and 1965, other than the tension between the city and the county governments, the funding was a pretty stable five cents per 100. It was only in, in 1965 that the funding problem really became a big issue. Don't know all the legalities of it, but apparently in 65, there was a reassessment rollback tax on the free market value of property. And as a result, the five cents that the library would normally get was um, decreased down to, I think, 2.1 cents. Wow, that's a significant yeah, that, drop. That's a, that's a big decrease there. And so the library filed suit over this lack of five cents per $100. Because, like I said, keep in mind, this was the state law, mm -hmm. that we were to get five cents or up to 15 cents. Mm -hmm. Now, we got the bare minimum, but it was state law we are supposed to get five cents. And, of course, the board did not like this rollback uh, in funding. So in, they filed suit, and in 1970, the court ruled, the circuit court ruled in favor of the library, but they offered uh, the possibility of a settlement it, they wanted to see if the city and the board could reach a solution mm -hmm. for this funding issue. The The city, which was led by the Tom Underwood faction of city government, mm -hmm. back in those days, uh, the city commissioners were quite powerful. Yeah. And Tom Underwood had this faction of city commissioners, and they pretty much called the shots. 
and they decided that the library was going to get a certain amount of money, and that's it. And so this led to some uh, threats of withholding of funding unless a settlement was reached. So the library board in the city did reach a settlement in the summer of 1970, that under duress, I may add, because <laughs> they were threatening to just withhold all money. And the library was real close to shutting down. Mm. You know, if this, continue, if this battle between the city government and the board continued, it even got to the point in the late 60s, early 70s, the library had to sell a lot of donated uh, artifacts like John Audubon, John James Audubon's uh, prints, mm. the Ipswich Cartillary which was a very historical medieval document that somehow ended up in the library and a bunch of other rare books. We had to sell a lot of stuff just to keep the library afloat because of this funding decrease. And so under duress, the board did agree to uh, settle with the city. And the settlement was basically in 1970, we would be funded at 2.6 cents, and then for each, the next five years, it would increase by a tenth of a cent. So 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, until we got to 3.0 in 1974, and it was supposed to remain there for the time being. It was a tough time for the library. You can't do much if you, ha if you don't have the funds <laughs> with the library, especially when the population keeps increasing and people's needs are not met. So it's, it's hard. One thing that helped get the library through this, not only the settlement, was, you know, the Friends of the Library, which was another thing that Virginia Hayes mentioned when she first got here in 1946, was she wanted to start a Friends, Friends of the Public Library group. And for some reason, it never got off the ground until in 1968. And this is about the time Miss Hayes left the Friends of the Library was formed. And they were very important during this time helping the library get through this funding crisis. Yeah, to, to this day, we can't, I mean, a lot of the programming is, happens because of the support of the Friends. So yes. we really appreciate that. Yeah, we have the Friends and we have the book, uh, the bookseller yeah. down in the basement. The Friends have been a vital member of the library community. Yes, and Definitely. Probably wouldn't have got through this crisis yes. without them. During the 70s, many things occurred, some good, some bad. We, we still didn't have quite the funds. And I can't say this enough, the state law was not being followed. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's probably reasons, you know, city government may not have the money. The board knew they didn't have the money. Yeah. So there was a lot of give and take mm -hmm. to um, reach the funding that we got. But in the back of at least one person's mind, <laughs> I'm not sure at that time, but there's there was at least one citizen that was saying, hey, we're supposed to be getting five cents per hundred dollars. So anyway, you know, we ended up at the mercy of the city government for the funding. The city government was not abiding by the state law. But in the meantime, we still able to open some satellite branches. Y yes. You know, after the settlement, the library did begin to upgrade the library. Uh, in 1972, the uh, Southland branch, which was a precursor of what is now the Beaumont branch, the Southland branch opened up in October of 1972 on uh, Southland Drive. Mm -hmm. uh, the building, uh, by the way, at 521 Southland Drive is still there. Yeah. I think I drove by there a few weeks ago, and I, I don't know, it's maybe an art gallery or not, but it's it's still there. But it was a rental building. We did not own that property. It's, it's yeah. rental, yeah. And you yeah. can talk more about the rental, yes, yes, rental yes. part there. <laughs> in 1976, in the first library construction since the uh, Carnegie building was built 73 years before, the new Lansdowne branch opened up on Tate's Creek Road. Yeah. Which was named after? Uh, Josephine Staples Emrith yeah. was the board chairman at the time in the 70s. Mm -hmm that the, the Lansdowne branch was being planned. And she died shortly before the branch opened up, and they named it in uh, honor of her. Okay. Now, her father was Charles Staples, who actually started our local history index, which is a very important reference tool that we still use to this day. He, he was a local historian. Yes. And it was maintained by library employees? And yes. Robin Rader and Jan Marshall were very prominent in the... Uh, when I got here in the early 90s, Robin was the uh, Kentucky Room librarian. 
and Jan was the in charge of the local history index. Mm-hmm. The Kentucky Room actually won an award years later for the local history index, and those two people played a big part in that. So, you know, we mentioned the Lansdowne branch opening up in 1976. In March 1979, the uh, Eastland branch, the precursor of what is now the Eastside branch, opened up in a storefront over in the Eastland Shopping Center. And this was also a rental property. Uh, yeah, these these were rentals other than the Lansdowne branch. Because the library couldn't afford to buy yeah. its own property. And, and, you know, you may want to comment about we're restricted yeah, it is rental rental property, of course, for the library restricts what you can do with a, a space. Library services changes, of course, over the years. And so you're kind of constricted to just that space. You know, you have to get permission to knock down walls or, you know, put up anything. So, and a lot of times these spaces are very small. So while, while the library is appreciative of, of a space and the customers are as well, it's very hard to make decisions around what your customers needs and what kind of service you want to provide. So... Of course, it's always better to own your own property and your own building and be able to design it the way that you, that the library feels like will be, uh, you know, optimal in, in library services. So, yeah. Yeah, I know when the library, I know this through the research, not that I remember it from the day, when the library moved to Southside in 1972, yeah. they had a rental agreement with, I think, a lady who owned the property and everything went fine for, you know, 15 years or whatever, but when she passed away, the uh, folks that took over the building were a little more, they wanted more money, Ah, okay. uh, and the library just couldn't pay it, and they wanted uh, like a long-term agreement, and the library just couldn't, from a financial standpoint, do that, so so that's the reason why the Southside branch moved to the Halloween location in 1985, mm-hmm to another rental, an old pickpack store on Halloween Drive, because they couldn't reach an agreement with the new owners of the building on Southland Drive. I always get that confused. When it was on Southland Drive, it was called a Southland branch. When it went over to uh, Halloween, it was called Southside. Yeah. So uh, anyway, but you know, like like I mentioned earlier, there were, there was at least one citizen who kept in mind that, hey, you know, the law is five cents per hundred dollars. <laughs> you know, the board was, they didn't want to create waves with the city government because they both had to work hand in hand. So settlements, negotiation was just part of the gig back then. Well, I think it was also for fear of just losing everything. Yeah. Yes. The so. library, like I mentioned earlier, was kind of under duress and the city government was uh, kind of running the show. Yeah. But A man by the name of Joseph Hayes, Dr. Joseph Hayes, who was a uh, professor or researcher or both over at the University of Kentucky and then ended up going to the state government to work in the Department of Transportation, went into the Carnegie Building. Now, I got to keep in mind, in the the 60s and 70s, the Carnegie Building was an old building, and it was just being run down, and we didn't have the money to fix things. Leaks, bad flooring, bad wiring. And the director at the time, Ron Steensland, would be quoted in newspaper articles that, uh, you know, the building is just falling apart and we need a new building, but we don't have the money for it. And there was talk about moving at some point to the old Stewart's building, which is right next door or was next door to where we are now. But that, that fell through. Well, anyway, getting back to Joseph Hayes, he went over to the Carnegie Center, I think, in 1979 and According to one newspaper report, he was refused access to the second floor because the library felt like the structural damage up on the second floor made it unsafe for patrons. So he, he didn't. He was he, he was very frustrated by that and just the overall condition of the building. And he went to his lawyer, a friend of his, uh, down the street. He just left the library and just walked down to his lawyer's office and said, "Hey, what can we do about this?" And they both said, hey, they're supposed to get five cents per hundred dollars. Anyway, he filed suit in December of 1979. The library board didn't have anything to do with the lawsuit. The city government was being sued. By a citizen? uh, By one citizen. Uh, It was a class action suit, but Joseph Hayes was, and William Jacobs was his lawyer. Those 
two men are very and did a lot for the library. Well, they were instrumental in the history, so it was a very pivotal time for the library. And, you know, when you talk about library history buildings, you can't talk about the history of the buildings without talking about the funding because oh, they yeah. both go hand in hand. Of you get, course. you got to have the money, mm-hmm. as you know, with the new village branch. Anyway, Hayes filed a lawsuit in 1983, April of 83, I think it was. The circuit judge, Armin Angelusi, ruled in favor of the library. He said, this, hey, this is a state law. It must be followed. And, of course, the city filed an appeal. And uh, in 1984, the Court of Appeals affirmed Angelusi's ruling, and the Supreme Court declined to even look at it after that. And so, because they, the law was there, it yeah, the law yeah. was there. It, yeah. it wasn't any discussion. And Mayor Basler at the time, I think, just decided, hey, you know, it's better to work this problem than to just create more by taking it through the courts. So the the city and the library formed a partnership. This new funding. Let me make sure I got my numbers right here. But the year that the lawsuit was filed, 1979, that fiscal year, the library received $1.2 million based on a $4 billion property valuation, where they should have got $2.6 million. So there's a, a big difference. Yeah, but that's a big uh, discrepancy. Yeah. And so anyway, the lawsuit made all the difference in the world. Yeah. The library now had uh, money for new buildings. The North Side One, that's what I call the North Side One, opened up in 1984. And I think that was that was already in the works before uh, the lawsuit, before the lawsuit mm-hmm. was settled. Maybe bonds were issued, state grants, what have you. So the money and and of course the city was putting in. The money was already budgeted for the North Side branch. That opened up in 1984 and eventually became North Side 2, I always refer to it as North Side 1, <laughs> North Side 2. They're both on Russell Cave Road. Just up the street, yeah. yeah. The land was actually donated by Julia McCullough back in the early 80s for the new branch. And, you know, in talking about the history of the library and the history of the buildings and the funding and so forth, I don't think we should neglect the community support. Oh, yes. Uh, like the Junior League. There's lots of community organizations, including the friends who have done great things for the library over the years and they don't get recognized a lot not enough we cannot we cannot say thank you enough to these organizations because definitely without them we wouldn't be able to to do anything yeah so anyway the lawsuit was settled the city and the library board worked in partnership for plans for new buildings the building we're in now the central library building opened up in 1989 a direct result of Joseph Hayes's lawsuit. In 1992, the Eagle Creek branch moved from the Eastland Shopping Center to the Eagle Creek branch, and it opened up in September of 92. It was on Richmond Road. Yeah, off Richmond Road. Off of, yeah. Eagle Creek Drive. And that eventually became the East Side branch. Yeah, later on. In 2016. As I mentioned, you know, the East Side opened up in 2016. We got the new North Side in 2008. Beaumont, which started out as the Southland branch, opened up in 1997. And the Lansdowne branch eventually became the Tate's Creek branch, 2001-2002. So this this is all possible with, with, with all this the funding. funding. Yeah. You know, yeah. we couldn't have done this without the funding. Funding and library building histories go hand in hand. And that brings us to one last branch, the Village Branch, which opened up in 2004, September, I believe, 2004, in a rental storefront on Versailles Road. And we're getting prepared. We've already moved out of, of it, and we're in a temporary space right now. But, Miriam, you're... Yeah, gonna... well, at the time, this would be the sixth library location. And there was a huge gap in this corridor for library services. So... In 2004, of course, the Village Branch opened and under the helm of then the library manager, Betty Abnushani. And it was predominantly serving the local Latino or Hispanic community. So it was a bilingual library. There was a huge service need. Uh, it was a small, small location. There was hardly any room for any kind of collection to be housed, but whatever was there was was well used and well loved. But it was a predominantly like a service type library. It provided ESL services, after school homework help. So it was called Village Branch 
and it was a collective space for the village in that area. A lot of people came walking to that location, so it was very well used, very well loved location. The branch that is going to open again on Versailles is going to be called the Marksbury Family Branch. And that's another community organization that we are very, very appreciative of. Without their support, you know, none of this would happen. You know, Village was, like I said, a very community anchored library. We needed a new library for that community. And all the more that we were able to keep it in that space and in that exact spot. It was definitely a dream come true for a lot of the staff there and a lot of the community members. And we really appreciate the the support of the Marksbury family for making that possible. I'm looking forward to the groundbreaking because historically, the library of these new buildings Mm -hmm would have groundbreaking programs. And, you know, researching this through the archives, you would see all these pictures of families and little kids with little shovels. Well, this is going to be different, of course, because there is actual physical. It was a rental back then. Now we actually own that whole entire property, with the exception, of course, of Save-A-Lot and the Family Dollar next door. But there's not going to be an actual literal groundbreaking there's going to be a demolition first. (laughs) We have to demolish what's there first in order to be able to build the building that we have envisioned along with the architects. So that's going to happen hopefully soon. And we're looking at a couple of years before we're able to open in 2024. Other things I do want to mention, I I have never thought, and many people that I've talked to feel this way, that uh, Joseph Hayes has gotten his due credit for what he did. I mean, it's not easy for a lone citizen to take on city government. In fact, he was quoted at the time saying he took on City Hall and won, and he said something to the effect of, everybody should try it, you know? <laughs> but without him doing what he did, I don't know what how this... Oh, definitely not. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a concerned citizen, and he knew his voice yeah. and had the backup for it. And, so he know, made his voice heard, and uh, thankfully, it was successful. And, and, and he had the law behind him. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and I also want to mention, too, we talk about uh, the fiscal library buildings that we've been in over the years. Yeah. But with the new technology now, we have what we call the virtual branch. Yes. E-book service, mm-hmm. e-audio book, e-librarian service where people can uh, – can uh, email us with their questions, Kentucky Room questions, and we can research it and send it to them. So when you talk about library buildings, we are now including our virtual Yeah, the branch. World Wide Web is yeah. a big world. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so we're able important. to, you know, this, this podcast, we're able to reach people from across the world. People listen to us in Europe. So it's a good way to reach people outside of the physical building and be able to disseminate information to the people that need it. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But to to sum it up, the the library has had a 200 and what, 200, over 220 years of history. A lot of rough times, a lot of people getting the job done when it had to get done. And we have benefited from it and we need to continue to pass the torch and do our bit. For the next generation, that that's what the podcast and the build theme uh, this week's about. Definitely, we have a lot of people to to thank for that, including community people, the lo- even the local city government. Without their support, yeah. begrudgingly or or not, yeah. we wouldn't be able to to do what we do. We can't leave out the staff that have worked here throughout the years. Without them. Yeah. Nothing, nothing would matter. Yeah. And you talk about the turbulent times. I mean, the past. Oh, gosh, what, three years now going on this pandemic? It was a very, very difficult time for for staff, and the library buildings had to be shut down, and not all of them were able to provide services to the community like we wanted in the early part of this pandemic. But the community support was instrumental during the time, and the virtual branch. That, I mean, without without the virtual branch, I think would... Virtual branch came through big time. Oh, yes, yeah. And continues to do so. You know, people... Love those ebooks, yes. e audio books. They love to get on there and email us questions. And yeah, maintaining our databases. And, you know, in closing, when people thank me personally or thank the library for the service we provide, I always remind them, hey, that's what your tax money pays yes, for. Exactly. So, and they're very appreciative. Money well spent. Yes, it is. 
and they're very appreciative. Thank you so much for your research, Wayne. We really appreciate having you here as always. It's always a good time talking to you. Thank you so much for, for listening. For more information about the history of the Lexington Public Library, please visit us in the Kentucky Room at the Central Library, where a wealth of information can be found in both the open and closed stacks. We appreciate you spending your time with us. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at lexpublib.org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.